And these fellows are under fire being shot. Because <laughs> that's what happened, in a sense, to their predecessor. This is where things get real. You have just traveled through the city. And you are now on the outskirts of Fredericksburg in 1862. The city ostensibly ended about a block away. There was an open cemetery called the Corporation Burying Ground, which is modern day Hercamp Park. Beyond that were stables. And then from here, down this hill, was a straggling suburb of the city. We are an area that was known as Freetown. Free African Americans inhabited this side. They lived here, they worked here. Down the hill, it was known as Sandy Bottom in 1862. For the Civil War soldiers, they're glad that the African American community lives here because their houses are the last buffer between us and the Confederates across a wide open field, 900 yards away. This is your last hope of sanctuary. The Irish Brigade are the first troops to march out this street. They followed their division commander, Winfield Scott Hancock, until they got to this point. And then they formed for battle. They laid out their five regiments side by side. On the right would have been the 69th New York Volunteer Infantry. To their left would have been the 88th New York. In the middle, the 28th Massachusetts. To their left, 63rd New York. And out on the end, the newbies, the 116th Pennsylvania. And they gear up for battle. Fortunately, they tell us about the bend in the road. And as you look backward, you can see the bend right where we kept straight. And we wound up in a park because the street bends and goes down to your lap. So that little bend and a straggling group of houses allowed you to march down this street without being directly observed. Doesn't mean you're safe. Shellfire is now starting to search the city. They're looking for the Union soldiers. And more than once, the shell's gonna land directly in the middle of the street. The men march in columns of four. And more than once, an entire row of four were taken out by one shell. As they line up here, looking over the roofs of the houses on the slope below, they can see the Confederate line. The high ground out on the horizon is Marie's Heights. Those on the right can even see buildings on top of Marie's Heights. That's the University of Mary Washington. Those in the center might even be able to make out a white gabled roof, which is the Marie Mansion, Brompton. The rest of you, I'm afraid you're kind of stuck with these pillars. But it would have all been a wide open panorama for you in 1862. What did it look like? William H. McClellan, 88th New York. As we reach the outskirts, great shell, canister, shrapnel, that all met us and made great gaps in our ranks. Laying our men out in death on the side of the road. William McCarter, as we reached the western edge of the city, we suddenly came in full view of the enemy's works, their entrenchment. We saw what fearful havoc had been made among the troops of the first assaulting division. We saw their dead and the large numbers of the wounded, which lay thick in front of the heights. There's a profound amount of smoke, of black powder, 
the cannons on the hills in front of you bombard this open field and this edge of city. As the smoke billows up, it lingers. It's opaque. It obliterates your view. Captain John Donovan, 69th New York. He's been only in a couple of battles. The last battle was Melbourne Hill in July, and his eye was shot out. He had just convalesced and came back to active duty today. A timely arrival. <laughs> Captain John Donovan, with his one arm, will tell us about the smoke. Noonday is turned to dusk by the storm and the smoke of battle. Shells are bursting all around us. Solid cannonballs are shot. We're going to be hitting the ground. There's lots of mud here. But underneath the mud is a substrata of dirt that has not thawed. It's like ice. When the shells hit it, they bounce like rubber balls careening through the rack. 69th New York. A private said, the ground was frozen hard and cannonballs striking the rock like earth Ricochet with to all appearances increased vigor. Captain Patrick Condon, 63rd New York. The fire on us right here is galling and destructive. We stand here and then drop. There's nothing you can do about it. The generals are preparing to lead these men into battle. Nobody has ever led an attack out this street. We're going to be the first. And as the Irish Brigade gears up to do that, a second brigade under John Caldwell forms up behind them. The 5th New Hampshire is in their ranks. The 5th New Hampshire and the 69th New York have a love-hate relationship. Half the time, they hate to love each other. The other rest of the time, they love to hate each other. <laughs> They're forever doing bad things and pinning it on the other guy. The commander of the 5th New Hampshire is a man named Edward Cross. According to one of his friends, he's one of only four lawyers he ever met who was quiet. <laughs> Cross looked at this field and despaired. He asked his servant, to go take care of his locker and make sure that it got to his family after he was killed. It's only the 69th New York that doesn't despair looking at this field. Colonel Robert Nugent, commander of the 69th New York, is going to seek out dour old Colonel Cross and try to cheer him up. Tell him, so-and-so, Cross, so-and-so. But if you get to Richmond before I do, order me dinner at the Spotswood Hotel, and I will dine with you. Just the sheer audacity that we're going to make it across this field and get to Richmond and have the finest dining in the city. Even Cross had to chuckle. <laughs> General Hancock is now ready. He's going to order his men forward. And as the Irish Brigade depart, they're going to enter into an open field. The first of four fields between us and the Confederates. As they go, Hancock on horseback is going to ride down the slope with them. They will be under fire instantly. And men will start to drop. A lieutenant in the 116th New Pennsylvania is going to be shot in the arm, in the leg, in the side, and in his lung, all at the same time. As he lay on the ground breathless, soldiers stopped and tried to pick him up, asking, where are you wounded? And the only thing he could answer was, all over. He lived. 
many didn't. General Hancock went down this hill with five staff officers. All five of them are going to have had their horses shot. Three of the five staff officers are themselves going to get wounded. General Hancock almost was killed.